Hello and welcome to another edition of the Youthful and Useful podcast by Leap Africa. We bring you insightful conversations and information essential for your all-round development. We believe that the future of Africa is bright and the youth play a significant role in bringing into reality the Africa we want. I am Bemileke Anthony and in this episode titled Responsible Leadership, Designing the Blueprint for Prosperous Africa, we will be centering on the importance of ethical leadership in building the Africa we want. This episode focuses on the keynote address delivered by the former Commissioner for Education for Lagos State, Mrs. Folashade Adefisayo, during a webinar to commemorate our 21st anniversary. Her address calls for young people to embrace values-based leadership across the public and private sectors in Africa. After transitioning from years of work in the private sector to working with the government, Mrs. Adefisayo gives some context about her work and the differences that stand out as a professional with experiences in both sectors. The public service is very different from corporate Nigeria. I'd always worked in private schools, I'd, I'd been director of a school, I'd, I'd done things like that. But the last three years before I became a commissioner, I actually worked in the public sector. But again, as a consultant, I'm not full time. So I wasn't privy to the, the way their process, the internal processes worked. I happened to work with Osho State Government, where I was asked to run one of the mega schools built by the government of Arabe Shola. This was in Oshobo, and I ran this school beautiful school, lovely children for like one and a half years, during which I knew why I totally understood my purpose in life. Uh, it's because of children like that who don't have access to the funding and so on that other children do have. Children from very poor homes, because uh, can, you can imagine that they were asked to pay 2,000 Naira each. Some paid 10 times. Uh, in tranches of 200 today, 50 tomorrow, 300 the day after. I'm sure that many of us here cannot comprehend somebody not having 2,000 Naira and having to pay it uh, over like a, uh, six months or so. But those are the children I was dealing with. But there I saw a lot of talent, a lot of love of self, a lot of love of country, a lot, a lot of optimism. Children who believed that, oh, things can get better and should get better. Of course, they were tainted, of course, like all our students are by the poor value system we have around us. They had not had a good enough uh, initial quality of education. In fact, many could not read and I was dealing with senior secondary. So you, 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 I had to come to Lagos to talk to a lot of my friends that, look, give me books. I remember driving down to, to Shobo in my car and I had to drive because nobody else could sit in the car with me. The teachers, an old Prado, filled with books from many schools. And here yeah, I have to say thank you to friends who gave me books. So I, 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 I was able to set up like a, a place where children could learn to read because there were just no, they had, some had never read a storybook before. It was a very different demographic. And like I said, I think it prepared me for this job. It let me know that these are very talented, clever, smart children. Their problem was just that they were poor. And that was surely not their fault. It was mere accident of birth that they were born to parents who could not afford the things that most of us can afford. So after I left Toshubu, I now went to Benin, where I worked with the Edu Best project, where using the power of technology, teachers were able to teach across Edu State. And this led to ma massive changes in the public school system in Edo State, with children come to wanting to join, with rising population of uh, public schools. It led to, of course, improved teaching and learning. It led to children being able to read at the right time. In fact, there was a process where they did uh, something called teaching at the right level, where students were taught according to their ability to read. And, and also, so, so I was there with all sorts of projects being done deliberately to improve teaching and learning in the classroom to improve public schools. And there again, I met another set of human beings, wonderful people who worked with their whole heart and mind, who gave of what they had so that the children in their community could rise and grow. And that from there, I now came to Lagos State, never having been a politician, 
never having been a civil servant. I wasn't used to the methodologies by which people worked. I wasn't used to so many things. And of course, being the CEO of an organization at a point in my career, I was used to saying, to approving things and having them done within a week or two. I didn't know there were places where you approve things and six months later, nothing much has been done because of the very, very bureaucratic, slow processes. And because, and this of course gives way to rent seeking. So of course, I mean, people wouldn't help or wouldn't do what they should do because they were all expecting something or the other. That was a massive culture shock for me. And I really had a very steep learning curve. I say it myself that I made mistakes, uh, mistakes which came because I didn't know that uh, people needed things from me in order to do their work. I didn't know so many things and, and that saddened me a lot. But I think for, for, and that is where leadership comes in. When you are a leader, you have no time to start worrying about your mistakes. You rise up, dust yourself and move on. And so that was something that I owed myself in that uh, task, in that I would get up and say, the next challenge is coming and I have to meet it. I have to understand why I'm here. And, that, and honestly, I would say this, that I've worked with many people, I've worked in many places, but I have rarely seen the kind of people that I worked with in the civil service. I worked with some really superb people, very clever, very smart, very knowledgeable. You see, there's a lot of knowledge residing in the civil service. There's a lot of understanding of, 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 of their environment, of the processes, of the best way to do things. They are professionals in the true sense of the word. So I think for us, We've got to disabuse ourselves of that notion that I'm going to work with people who do. No, no, they know more than people who work in corporate gov in uh, corporate Nigeria because they've seen many more situations. It's like when you go to a hospital where they mainly like a little hospital in the corner of your neighborhood where they are used to dealing with fever, temperature, and so on. And you go to somewhere like Luth where <laughs> they are used to dealing with the worst possible cases. So you know that there's a great knowledge gap between those two kinds of institutions. And that was what I meant. The Honorable Commissioner indeed has a wealth of experience improving education outcomes across Nigeria. Having stuck to her values while working in the private sector, she shares tips and reasons that helped her mainstream responsible leadership during her time as the Commissioner for Education. So in working there, how does one bring in one's values. I was very particular about my values and for many reasons. And the first was I had worked all this time without doing things that I felt were anti everything I believed in. And I was still comfortable enough with what I was doing. I did not emerge as a wealthy person or anything, but wealth was never my focus. But to live the way I always want to live, to be able to travel, to be able to buy books, to be able to read, to be able to meet with a lot of people, that, those were always the values that excited me. And so if I was always able to do that, I didn't really mind much about wealth. So I had worked in all these places. And so that was the value for me in working. For me, what were these values? Secondly, I had succeeded so far, I felt, in everything I had done without falling out of the upbringing that my parents had given me. My father, uh, who I'm always proud to say, Michael Adebayo Ifatuloti was uh, Commissioner for Education and Commissioner for Economic Development first and then Education in the Old West. In and so I grew up in Ibadan. And when I was an undergrad in university, my father was Commissioner for Education in the West. And my dad left that job in the 70s. Uh, he passed away uh, like 10 years ago, but up till now, we have not seen anything untoward about him. Wherever I have gone in my life, whether when I was getting married or everywhere, people always greeted me and said, oh, you are the daughter of M.A., a good man, a really good man, an honest man, a diligent man, a clever man. I'm his daughter, his first child. And I said, no, that legacy is so strong. I must not be the person that spoils it. So that was always dry, a driving force for me. And always a driving force for me as an educationist who are the students. What do I owe them? Do I owe them anything? What should I do to 
to ensure that every child who comes in contact with me is a better off for it. And, and my mantra as an educationist was simple. There is an A-star in every child. My job is to find that A-star. I'm not talking about A-star in uh, exam scores. I'm saying inside every child, there's a genius waiting to be tapped and discovered. My job as an educationist is to tap into it and discover that. And so these were the guiding forces that followed me even into the commissionership position. It was not an easy time and maybe one day I'll be able to write my experiences without betraying confidences but it was a very very tough time for me indeed because I had these things always always before me and to help me along the way I had my father's photograph so that I, I could always glance up and say oh Baba what would you have done if you were faced by this particular circumstance and uh, I thank God Almighty that the fourth guiding principle overarching over everything was my belief in God and my trust that if I did well and I was not ashamed to go to my father and say thank you I have done what you sent me into the world to do then I would know I was successful and I knew that my the reason why I came into this world was to influence children to make sure that every child like I said who comes into contact with me is a better off for it and so that it was just my guiding principle. Those were my four principles. Again, starting from my career track record, starting with my family background, remembering that it's all about the child, and of course, putting God before me. All these things were what concentrated my mind and allowed me to achieve whatever little success I achieved in this job. Purpose, a stellar track record, faith, and a family legacy of ethical leadership are strong motivations to stand one's ground when trying to lead in unfamiliar territory. It is clear that Mrs. Adefisayo did not stumble upon responsible leadership, but was intentional about cultivating it in her work. This is a noteworthy lesson for African youths. Values-based leaders are those who work hard at consistently living out their principles. Navigating unfamiliar concepts may be difficult, but true leaders are able to fail forward, rise to the challenge, and develop innovative solutions to the issues they encounter. Mrs. Adefisayo shares novel approaches she employed to tackle problems in the education sector within Lagos State. Why are we sending children to school? We have to remain focused on that. It's so that they come out and become productive citizens, living efficiently and effectively in the environment they are going into. In which case, we have to teach them everything. We have to provide a holistic education, which is way beyond academics. Academics are all well and good, but we have got to find a way by which children are going to be able to make a living. Many of these children in public schools are from very poor homes. When they are done, even if they pass WAEC, even if they have 9 a in WAEC, they cannot go to university because they cannot afford it. And so we have to find a way by which they can afford it. First, their scholarships. And secondly, we had to give them skills in school, which they could parlay and use in university. And so we started to think about things like comprehensive schools, where while they are doing uh, senior secondary, they learn at master level, honestly, how to do things like plumbing, carpentry, hair dressing, uh, fashion design, and so on. Uh, this, this started with a pilot of 12. We've been struggling a bit, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that it will, it will continue. There were other things that we had to think about, uh, like the curriculum. We all know that we all worry about the Nigerian curriculum. It's too broad, it's not, it's so broad that it's not deep. So deep learning doesn't happen. And, it, and because of the methods by which we assess learning, which we're looking at what education is to call the lower order thinking skills, it, 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 it further reinforces the need for the students to just cram and pour. We had to ensure deep learning. To ensure deep learning means that you have to embed concepts like critical thinking, problem solving, innovation, creativity into the curriculum. And so that's when we, and luckily I got in just at the start of a three year cycle where we would re readdress our schemes of work. We would use the Nigerian curriculum quite all right. We are Nigerians. So I felt that, but well, we should develop that curriculum in such a way that it is the curriculum that Nigeria should have. So we took the Nigerian curriculum, broke it into schemes, 
monthly, weekly, you know, by subject, 75 subjects across all levels from nursery to SS3, and of course, including technical subjects as well. Embedded core skills into them, core skills such as collaboration, teamwork, problem solving, critical thinking, embedded technical uh, IT into them, and then pushed out to the public. Again, because you are so analog, it was by print. But we set, we recently developed an app and, and we rolled it out. And that app should now be widely available for people where they'll be able to download our schemes. And we are starting another three-year cycle this year. So I'm hoping again that that is on the, it, that I build sustainability in such a way that it goes on whether I'm there or not. And so what do we teach our students? How do we teach our students? The people who are the most critical factor in any school, even beyond what you teach is who teaches. And we have to get teaching right. Uh, luckily, Lagos State is, it, it pays the highest salaries in the country. So our teachers, essentially, in the public service, please don't mistake me. We pay the highest salaries for public school teachers. And therefore, we were able to uh, attract teachers. We, st we, recruit, we started recruiting teachers, recruited nearly 10,000 teachers during my three and a half years day, and gave them really superb training. So what we're doing is really gently easing out the old and bringing in the new, the new with new skills who are taking through a very serious uh, orientation uh, program. So uh, we've done that. And then we had to look at uh, uh, these teachers too. When you do that, how do you ensure teachers have a sense of who they are? Luckily, again, in Lagos State, uh, teachers have a chance to become permanent secretaries. This is almost unheard of throughout the country and in, that, and in the federal service as well. But in Lagos State, uh, former teachers, uh, former principals, are, 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 you know, can get to the position of tutor general permanent secretary. And in which case they will be in charge of a group of schools, ensuring that teaching and learning goes on well there. So we were happy that we had true professionals as our permanent secretaries. And with that, there was a career path. So we reinforced that by working with our principals, holding them accountable for results. Saying, look, the wire results have come out. Things like competitions are happening. Bad behavior is happening in your school. You are the principal, you are, you are in charge of it. So these are some of the measures that we took, holding them accountable, getting them to develop plans for how they were going to address uh, uh, problems, giving them more funds to be able to run their schools. Because the running cost they were getting was really abysmal. It's still poor. But we were able to multiply two and a half times in one instance and uh, five times in another instance and double it in another instance so that they at least had a bit more with which they could, uh, with which they could run their schools. And uh, so this, this, this went on, uh, you know, that is the, the ability of the principals giving them more skills so they can run their schools, giving them more funds so they to run their schools so that we're able to address the schools as well. You know, you will notice that anything I say, I don't, I cannot ascribe it to myself as commissioner. I must ascribe it to the fact that the state had people in that position, even before me, who were committed to how we could improve the schools. And then infrastructure. Luckily, the governor was willing to listen to us and therefore expended quite a huge sum. Billions of Naira on repairing at least we had about 1,800 different projects, furniture, toilets, whole school buildings, new schools. New schools had not been built in Lagos for many years. And clearly there was a dearth of schools. We were able to set up 23 new schools across the state and, uh, and have children in all these schools, which we're very proud of. I think this is a great legacy of the Sun Woodrow administration to be able to set up schools, something that hadn't been done for so, so many years. And there were other projects. There was team. Uh, we, 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 there was a public, uh, you know, determination to work with the private sector. And so we had all sorts of partners. I think when they saw that we were serious, because the development partners said they couldn't come to Lagos. We are rich, apparently. So we had to look for support elsewhere. So we had uh, uh, old school, old students associations, all sorts of NGOs faith-based organizations, all sorts of institutions supporting us. We had the, some were training our students and our teachers, some were giving us their curriculum, some were building labs and workshops for us. There was a chap who donated a, a project a year, a library, sick bay, and so on. So we had this group of maybe about 150 supporters, and which was quite remarkable, and uh, who supported us in various ways. So you can see it was a collaboration of so many people working together. Leadership is about service. And so the best leaders are those who are humble and willing to serve others. 
Giving her final remarks, the Honorable Commissioner shares how clarity on what her values were and a dogged determination to uphold them helped her stay the course as a civil servant. In rounding up, and I do have to round up now, I, I, I tried to study and find out now. When you talk about leadership, what 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 and, and values? What should how should a leader pass on their values? One of the first things is you have to be clear about yourself. Leadership is about serving others. Leadership is about making others look good. Leadership is humility. It's not about pushing yourself and saying I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. People will acknowledge you. That comes, but it's not the reason. And so you have to be clear in your person that I want to serve. I'm here to serve. And that's why I still enjoy many of us in private life to join the public service because you should want to serve. That is where you can scale. When people greet me and say, I'm the mother of a million children and still counting. Yes, there are about a million children in our public schools. There are 2.5 million children in school in Lagos. So I, I don't count myself as mother of one. I actually count myself as a mother of 3.5 to 4, 5 million children, including those out of school who we have to provide for, who grow every day due to unbridled migration into Lagos, such that for the first time in many, many years, we now have a huge population and we have to provide for them, which would involve the use of technology. So a leader has to, has to be clear and I think and I'm going to still keep talking about Lagos State and by and being a leader with values. What are your own values? Who are you? What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be remembered for? You want to be remembered because you had a Rolls Royce and you had uh, what do you call it? And, and, and you had uh, 15 houses around the world. What are you going to do with all those? I consider myself one of the richest human beings that have ever lived because of those five to six million children. Because wherever I go and whatever I do, somebody always comes up to say, I know you, you did, if it hadn't been for you, you did this for me. Because of you, I'm who I am. So I count myself one of the richest human beings who has ever, ever lived. And I thank God for that. Because it was not because of me, but because he supported me and gave me the spirit to be able to do the things that I did. So I think you have to be clear about your values, who you are and what you want. If what you want is to be extremely rich, there's another pathway for that. And there's nothing wrong with it. I have no problems with it. I, as a person, I'm clear about what I want. And I think I have achieved to a large extent what I want. The second thing about clarity is let the people who work with you know. When I came in and I looked at my desk, there was no computer. Well, how can I work like this? So they knew immediately that this is not a commissioner who will be writing viral all the time. I need technology around me. And when COVID came, and when I started preaching about technology, people were like, no, this is public service. It can't work. We have 1 million children. 1,700 schools, how can we? So COVID came and all the children were indoors. What do we do? We had to do something. So we started from the lowest form of technology, which was radio. We got people to donate. But the first donation was mine. I, do, I called my staff. I am going to donate. I'm going, the radios are to 2,000, but we found that there were children in Lagos State who could not afford a radio. So we had to look. I said, look, my first donation will be mine. And we got so many people to donate for us. Then we got to a stage where a bank noticed and donated devices and were able to give our students uh, mobile devices. We were able to work with a company that gave us soft, uh, a platform where they could access the curriculum and teach and learn online. Our teachers are teaching on radio, teaching on Telegram, teaching on WhatsApp, teaching on, uh, on the internet itself. So you see what leadership and you galvanize people. You must be ready as a leader to take people out of their comfort zone. So that, you know, it was like, what can we do? Our children will stay at So Hopefully, COVID won't be for long. What if it is? So they, 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 these children will suffer immensely from staying at home. They, no matter what we did, they suffered immensely. But at least we cushioned this with some learning at home. And uh, I, I will always be grateful to organizations that supported us. We got free airtime. People said it wasn't possible. But I went around and some radio stations, some TV stations gave us free airtime. For a year, we were broadcasting every day for like four hours on some, te on some radio and television stations. So again, as a leader, lead from in front. I've never known anything but to be in front. I am the leader. Maybe as the first child of, uh, in a polygamous environment, you learn to say, look, I am the leader. We lead from in front. So a leader has to lead. They have to see. You have to role model 
it changes yourself. I have been in places where people have done things for me, and I'm like, why? You want to do this for me? I've been in places where people have gifted me things. That, in fact, that my family and I have a, a, a policy on gifts. Once it's above a certain value, I don't take it. So if they've gifted me something, I will say thank you. I may, I probably won't take it. But I will know that this person values me. So I urge all of us, even as we go on our leadership journey, it's a, it's a tough journey. And I'm leaving the place uh, older, grayer, possibly in poorer health. I've always been a very uh, healthy kind of person. Well, possibly slightly lower, poorer health. Uh, less, uh, more cynical than I've ever been, which, which I don't want and I'm going to fight. Uh, less, uh, with less belief in my fellow man, which I'm not happy about either. Because I keep wondering, what's your price? Why are you doing this? And so on. But I don't want to think about that. I want to go on this journey. And it has not ended for me. Because I have so many things that I want to do. I have no plans to retire. So I'm working on what I'm going to do in the next, next stage of my life. I thank Leap Africa for giving me this opportunity. I hope you heard me very well. I spoke from my heart. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Youthful and Useful Podcast by Leap Africa. We hope you've learned valuable insights about responsible leadership and its potential for delivering the Africa we want. As we learn from Mrs. Folashade Adefisayo, values-based leadership may be difficult, but at the end of the day, it is a rewarding journey one young people should consciously embark on. So whether you work in the public or private sector, now is the time to embrace ethical leadership so we can see sustainable change in our local communities and Africa at large. Before you go, we have exciting news. We are now accepting applications for YDOS. If you're curious about YDOS or you want to register or volunteer for a project, be sure to visit www.youthdayofservice.org. Africa's moment of change is now, and it can only happen when we are youthful and useful. <laughs>